Good evening, friends. It's good to be back with you here, our Wednesday night Lifeline Bible study here at Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. I'm glad that we can once again meet together. Uh, now that the Christmas holiday is over, I pray that you had a wonderful Christmas and looking forward to a wonderful new year. Last week, we were out as we were taking the children, the, the youth, around Christmas caroling to a few homes. Had a wonderful time doing that. And I believe those that we were able to visit had a wonderful time as well. Wonderful tradition here at Pleasant Hill and glad to continue with that. But also glad to be back with you tonight as we look back into the Word of God in our study in the book of James. And so if you would... Turn tonight to the book of James, and I would remind you that we have been in this book now for several weeks, uh, going through verse by verse through this wonderful epistle, this letter written by the half-brother of Jesus Christ, and an important message that we've been reading. But I pray that uh, you would make yourself at home uh, right there on your computer screen. And uh, I pray that you would pray along with us, that you would read along with us, and uh, learn along with us here tonight. We do invite you uh, to come to our Sunday school, in-person Sunday school, at uh, 9.45 in the morning on Sundays. Also, our morning worship at 10.45. Also, we have a youth hangout on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock p.m. Uh, we'll be having a little bit of a New Year's celebration tonight with, with some uh, snacks and, and pizza. And that is for uh, younger and older ages, basically three and up uh, can come and just hang out. We enjoy a wonderful time together. We also divide up into uh, younger and older for some activities most nights, but also for a Bible study. Uh, just a brief, just relaxed Bible study conversation, really, and then just kind of hanging out with friends. That takes place at 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights. And so just a little bit. We we'll partaking in that, and I invite you to join us. I'll pray for us and invite others to come and be part of any and all of these services as appropriate. Uh, we're going to open in a word of prayer. So find your place in the book of James, and I'm going to read our section, and then we will, we will pray together tonight. James chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. Now, we began, we began a couple weeks ago talking about wisdom, knowledge and wisdom, and talking about uh, how to, the, basically that knowledge or wisdom is knowing how to use knowledge. We'll come back to that. But the importance of getting wisdom is where we were at. And so we begin reading in verse 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation or a good lifestyle his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. Where, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Let's pray, and then we'll come back and we'll look at what we're talking about as far as getting how and where to find wisdom. Let's pray. Father, I do pray that you would be with us tonight. God, I pray that you would help us as we look into your word, as we study your word, that we would seek the knowledge of who you are, that we would seek the knowledge of how we are to live. But God, through seeking these things, we would find the wisdom in how to impart them in our daily lives, how to carry them out, how to apply them to our living. And God, that we would be wise in how we live, harmless as uh, wise as serpents and harmless as doves, as your word says. Says, but Father, that we would seek wisdom above all else. Help us to know where and how to find it, how to get it. Help us to learn. Help us to know where they come from. Help us to know the difference in what they are. Help us to know how they operate and how we can tell the differences. 
Help us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, what we're looking at again here is the difference, or where and how, to find wisdom. And of course, a couple of weeks ago, we began looking at the difference in knowledge and wisdom. And we talked about the differences, and sometimes you'll confuse the differences. But we also talked about the differences as far as where they come from. There is true wisdom, and there is a false wisdom. And the Word of God tells us here that there's a wisdom that comes from below. It is from earthly, sensual, and devilish. And there is a wisdom that is from above. And so the wisdom that is from above is godly, is godly wisdom. And that's the wisdom that we want. Don't confuse wisdom with knowledge. We talked about that last week. But don't confuse godly wisdom with worldly wisdom. We talked about that as well. And we talked about how they have different origins. There is a worldly wisdom that comes from, uh, not from above, but is earthly, worldly, sensual or sexual in nature, and devilish or demonic. And that is foolishness, but it is false wisdom, but it is often what the world calls wisdom. There's a worldly wisdom, wisdom that is from below, and there is a wisdom that is from above, that is godly wisdom. And we talked about a couple weeks ago about the difference in wisdom and knowledge. We talked about how knowledge is like information, intelligence. If someone is knowledgeable, they are intelligent. Um, and wisdom is knowing what to do with the intelligence that you've acquired or the knowledge that you've acquired. We all have known people, as I said last week, that are really, really smart. They have lots of knowledge about all kinds of things, but they can't tie their own shoes or they, they, they can't figure out how to get from point A to point B. Uh, they can write an instruction manual, but they can't figure out how to follow an instruction manual, if you will. Uh, and so there is a difference. And we talk about how lots of people want to get knowledge, and it's important to have knowledge, but more important than that is getting wisdom. The Bible says, above all, seek wisdom. Seek wisdom. But if we're going to seek wisdom, we don't need to know the difference. What is wisdom? What is knowledge? What are the differences? But then also we need to know what kind of wisdom are we looking for? And the fact that there is a difference between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. And of course, if we're a Christian, we want godly wisdom. Now, don't make the mistake of thinking that godly wisdom is not applicable to daily life. It is. It's not just for ministry. It's not just for church. So don't mistake that. But also the fact that knowing that there is a difference and knowing that there's a difference in where they originate, we want nothing as Christians to do with the worldly wisdom, logic, worldly logic, if you will, worldly thinking, if you will, the worldly way of doing things. We want God's way. We want God's wisdom. That's what we want. And again, the wisdom that is from below is earthly, is sensual, and it's devilish. But there's a wisdom that is from above. And so therefore we need to know the difference. We talked about that last week. Difference in how and where they originate from. Difference in what they are. And difference in what it is. But now we want to say, okay, so how do I know the difference? I mean, yeah, it's one thing to say, okay, I don't want worldly wisdom. But how do I know in this world what is worldly wisdom and what is godly wisdom? Well, James gives us, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gives us some signs or some evidences of the wisdom and where it comes from. We see that let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness and wisdom. We also see that if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. So we're seeing some signs, envying, strife, we're lying. We're seeing some of these as signs. And in fact, I want to give you, if I could, I want to give you four, make sure I've got that right, four signs of worldly wisdom or differences in how worldly and godly operate. And there's some signs of some things here that we see 
envying, strife, um, boasting, glorying, okay, and lying is four evidences that we're doing things if they were with a worldly wisdom. So let's go, and all we're going to hit tonight is these four signs that we might be operating in a worldly wisdom or how the worldly wisdom differs in the way it operates. We're comparing and contrast. What does the worldly wisdom say? What does godly wisdom say about these things? And we'll see, if again, matching it up here with these verses. And then next week, Lord willing, we will see the signs or the evidences or the differences where we see that Wisdom from above is pure and peaceable and gentle. And we'll get to that list next week. So follow with me in where we're at. So number one, these differences in how the breaking it down to two wisdoms, worldly wisdom, wisdom that is from below and godly wisdom, wisdom that is from above, how differences and how they operate. OK, that's where you want to be tonight. I don't want to lose you. This is, again, these, these books of James and First and Second, they're deeper books. The gospel is meant to be very simple. You could even say basic in many regards because it's a starting point. Not only the New Testament, but typically we point people to the gospels when a person either has, has not yet been saved or is newly saved so they can learn about the life of Christ. And then also we see that the people that were writing them, in large part, John, um, John Mark, the book of Gospel of Mark is kind of written by John Mark, but it comes from Peter's perspective. So you have two of the apostles there that are writing, and then you have like Matthew and you have Luke. Luke was a uh, traveler of, of Paul, and Luke is a little bit deeper than the other Gospels, writing from a physician's mindset and from a uh, former Pharisee's mindset as far as uh, Paul being a religious leader before he was converted to Christianity. Uh, we see that James here, the half-brother of Christ, who in the Gospels did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God, now he does. Now he's a pastor of a church, and he's matured. He's grown. He's changed. John, the Gospels of the, the letters of John, uh, he no longer is just the, the beloved disciple. He has matured. He's a pastor. He has grown. He is wiser. And so, therefore, it is deeper. Peter, who is so impetuous in the Gospels in many ways, but now he is wiser, he is deeper. And so therefore the letters are therefore a little bit deeper topics. So now follow along with me again if we get back on the course where we need to be. And I want to bring up sign number one or the differences in how they operate of false wisdom from below, worldly wisdom, and that is where we see the word Envy. We see the word in verse 14, envying. If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts. So these are things that are going to come about if you're living a life operating in worldly wisdom. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, the word envy here carries the meaning of selfish ambition and zeal. The word zealot comes from that. Someone says a fanatical about something, trying to get ahead, trying to uh, move forward, not just in life, but climbing the corporate scale or climbing the, 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 the societal scale, pyramid, if you will, to get to the top. That's the idea of carrying this selfish ambition and zeal, envying. You know, James warns about being ambitious about spiritual offices back in chapter 3, verse 1, where he says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we all receive the greater condemnation. In other words, don't be many teachers. You're seeking the office of this like you're claiming, like that's somehow special. And, and it is. It's no better than, but it carries a greater judgment if you're in that position because you are carrying forward the word of God to others and teaching. But, so James says, be careful about how you get ahead. Be careful about how you promote yourself. That's godly wisdom. Godly wisdom says, hey, uh, don't do that. Worldly wisdom says, promote yourself. Uh, put yourself out there. 
Make yourself look good. Do everything you can to make yourself look bad, good and others look bad. Because if you make others look bad, that's going to make you look all the, more, all the more good. It may not be that you're that good, but if I can make somebody else look really, really silly and bad, then I therefore have elevated myself. It may not be that far from the floor, but I'm making myself higher than they are and therefore good in the comparison in which we're paying attention Draw attention to yourself. Do, you know, get, get in the limelight. Seek the glory. Seek to be seen. Uh, I've already said this, but I'll say it again as i got it written down here. Making others even look bad. We live in a world where people constantly are trying not just to make themselves look good or to put the best foot forward. Nothing wrong with putting your best foot forward. But I want to make myself look better than you so I can get the promotion, so I can get the raise, so I can get the position. In the and, and again, we're talking in large part about the church here, but this, uh, this applies to everyday life. We need to understand that back in the Bible times, church was everyday life. We've gotten away from that in the world today. Uh, things used to operate around the church. And now, the church has to operate around things in the world. It's sad. It's a reality. Maybe it shouldn't be. Maybe we shouldn't allow it to be. But school schedules, sports schedules, kids' schedules, work schedules, used to be things operated around church. Things weren't open on Sunday. Sporting events, school events didn't happen on Sunday. Or even on Wednesday night, for that matter. And now they do. But, getting off base here. Make, the world says, make yourself look as good as you can. And what I started to say was, people have therefore tried to make others look as bad as they can, so they look better. Envy, that's worldly wisdom. Seeking to make myself, we ought to be zealous for the things of God. We ought to be zealous uh, about doing God's work, but with the right motives. You know, an example of this is the Pharisees used zeal in their religious activities, but they did so to promote themselves, to build themselves up. Uh, as sad as it is, as sad as we see this in many churches today. Where churches want to make themselves look as good, draw attention to themselves. Not just to get people to come hear the gospel, but for the sake of getting numbers, for the sake of getting money, for the sake of getting attention. That, that, there, again, there's a balance in promotion of an event or promotion of what God's, or, uh, God is doing or, or what God wants to do and being envious for yourself. The way I've written that down, the way I want to say that to you is this. Uh, we ought to be zealous for the things of God to the glory of God, not to self. Uh, we reflect the glory of God in the way we do things. We reflect the glory of God in how we do things, in the zeal in which we do things, in the ministry of the way we do things, in the heart of the way we do things, but we deflect the attention to God. So we reflect God and we deflect back to God. When I would say, hey, way to go. Good job. Fantastic. You did. Glory to God. Give God the praise. Here's a question for you. So well, how do I know which one I'm doing? Here's a question for you. Is our zeal for the Lord spiritual or carnal? Fleshly? Worldly? How do you know? Do we rejoice when others succeed. Again, this applies to everything in life. Do we rejoice when others succeed? Or do we only rejoice when we've succeeded? Do we rejoice when somebody else gets a promotion? Do we rejoice when somebody else gets a raise? Do we rejoice when somebody else gets a blessing? Do we rejoice when someone else does well? Or do we get jealous and envious? Do we secretly envy? Are we critical of their success. Oh, well, that just, they just always get the attention. They just always, they're always looking when they do it. 
They're only doing it when someone else is looking. Are we critical? Do we feel a burden when somebody else fails or falls, or are we glad? <laughs> About time they stepped in it. Do we seek the spotlight, the attention, the praise, or do we reflect and deflect? When the wisdom of the world infects the church, and it so often does, and there's a great deal of fleshly promotion and glory seeking, look at what I did for the church. Look at how sacrificing I was. Look at how sacrificial. Look at how generous I was. Number two, I move on. Strife. It says if you have bitter envying and strife or, or strife in your hearts, glory not. The word strife here means party spirit. And it has the idea of politics in it or politicking. It describes a, in, in the Greek uh, society, it would describe a politician canvassing for votes. We see this happen all the time in our world here in America. Politicking. Unfortunately, we even see it in the church. We see it in the workplace. We see it in the neighborhood, uh, neighborhood uh, housing boards, neighborhood community boards, whatever it might be. But we see politicking. Uh, the world says, get all the support you can. This is worldly wisdom. Get all the support you can by any means that you can. And ask people if they're on your side or on the other side. Ask people if they're for you or against you. Make the other person look as bad as you can so you can make yourself look as good as you can so that you can get the vote. We see this in politics. Politicians aren't typically talking about their ideas. And, and, and the majority of what we see in the news and the majority of what we see in politics is not people with great ideas. It's talking how bad or how silly or how stupid somebody else's idea is. Politicking. It's asking people if they're for you or against you. It, and, and it creates an idea, it creates uh, self seeking people that create rivalry and division in the world. Dividers, not uniters. Unfortunately, this takes place in the church as well. People get in, they, I want, you know, this color carpet, and then we begin to politic for that color carpet or that color of pew or that time zone or time uh, slot for uh, church service or a particular event or whatever it might be. We're worried that we're going to get the attention and we're going to get the credit for it. And it creates this division instead of an attitude of unity. That's worldly wisdom. Get my way. Politic and get as many votes as I can. The word of God says, let nothing be done through strife and vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better or more important than themselves. That's Philippians 2, 3. And then here in James, we see this. Don't glory if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts. Don't glory. Don't boast. Don't brag. Really, you can read this if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts. Glory not and lie not against the truth. So glory not really is about boasting. And I guess before I get to that, are you, let me ask the question, are you dividing or are you uniting in your church, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your fellowship groups, in your friendships? Are you promoting the idea of unifying or divide. A preacher, what if the other side is just really, really wrong? You can still promote the idea without trying to just get people over on your side. Are you bringing people or the body of Christ closer to Christ or are you driving them farther from Him? 
Boasting. But i got to move quickly. It's working me out of time. Boasting. The world says, tell people what you've done. What you've accomplished. You know, pride loves to brag. And there's nothing better to brag about than how wise you are. How smart, usually we get it wrong, how smart I am. How knowledgeable I am. And the know-it-all lets you know they know it all. The Word of God says if you receive the praise from the lips of men, then you've received your reward. James says, don't boast, don't brag. He says, but, but what if I'm trying to report on what we've done in the mission field or, or what God is doing in my life? How do I do that? There's a way that you can share what God is doing or has done. You can report about blessings or answers to prayer without bragging or boasting. So how do I do that? Well, be careful to give God the glory. Be careful to share the praise. Not just with God, because God gets all that, but when it's you went as a team, or you were working as part of a church, or whatever it might be, it's not just about the person up there talking. That one person may get up and do the talking, but it was all of us. This person did that, and that person. When you really want to get something accomplished, you're not worried about who gets the credit or who gets the lion's share. When godly wisdom is at work, there's a sense of humility and submission. Why? Because I'm not worried about who gets the praise. In, in fact, the only thing I'm worried about is that God gets the praise. Here's the thing. Are we comparing what we've done with what others have done? Or are we comparing what we've done to what God has done? What Jesus Christ has done? You see, we tend to compare ourselves to those around us. That's not a fair evaluation. We're not striving to meet the mark of our fellow men and women. We're striving to meet the mark of Christ. And when we do that, we realize how far we have to go and how little we really have done and how much we have to owe. Now, we can't earn our way into salvation and can't earn our way into God's love. We already have that if we're saved and we already have God's love because He says, I first loved you before you ever loved me. But my point is this. We don't compare ourselves to others. When compared with the work of Christ, we realize how far we have to go and just how much we do owe. Last thing, and I'll be done for tonight, is deceit. Deceit. Don't lie. So, don't be envious. Don't, be don't have strife in your hearts. Don't glory or boast. And lie not against the truth. Deceit. The world says, listen, it's a process. Be ambitious. Envy. And get ahead making yourself look as good as you can and better than the others by any means necessary. And then do so, in order to do that, resort to the party spirit or politicking or, if you will, what we said earlier, strife. So you resort to strife to win the votes so that you can win the election and to gain the vote and win the election you must brag about what you've done so others can see just how good you really are and how much credit you deserve and the bragging usually involves lying lie not against the truth thou shalt not bear false witness the world says hey do what you got to do to get ahead tell the stories you got to tell to get ahead we see this in politics and then politicians are caught said they were one place and they weren't said they were going to do something and they didn't said they did something and they failed to they did the opposite a man's life is not read in his press releases 
It is read by the Lord that is in his heart. Oh, my friends, we need to remember that wisdom, worldly wisdom and godly wisdom, wisdom from below and wisdom from above operate differently. And we can identify them by do we have envy, ambition, not godly ambition, worldly ambition in our hearts. And when we do, we'll have strife and conflict because we'll be dividing and not uniting, tearing down and not building up. And then we'll be bragging to make ourselves look better and to win the votes. And then in order to do that, we'll also be deceitful. That's the worldly wisdom. That's how you get ahead. That's how you get your way. That's how you get the praise. That's how you get the credit. That's how you get things done. But God says, not so. Not so. Don't fall for worldly wisdom and know the difference. And next week, we'll look at some signs of godly wisdom. Until then, strive, seek wisdom. Strive for wisdom. Above everything, get wisdom. Know the difference between it and knowledge. Know the difference of which one is better. Know the difference in where they originate. There is an above and a below. And know the one that you want is the one from above. And know the signs that point to the ones from below. And avoid it at all cost. We'll give a couple quick updates uh, in just a moment. Let me go ahead and pray first, and then I'll give some updates at the very end. But I do thank you for taking the time to listen and, and to watch. Uh, I pray that we would live in wisdom. Pray that this preacher would live in wisdom. It's not easy. I pray that you would live in wisdom. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd help us tonight. Help us to know the truth of knowledge and wisdom. Help us to know the differences. Help us to know the difference in origination. and different. Help us to know the difference in operation. Help us, I pray, but to seek godly wisdom as we go into this new year, every day of our lives. Let us grow in knowledge, but let us get wisdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A couple quick updates for you. I really just one that's on my mind right now, and that is that uh, Jeff Turner did get to come home yesterday. Uh, if you're on Facebook, you may have seen that, but Jeff did get to come home. Uh, so that's a major answer to prayer, and we want to keep praying for him, as obviously his body is still in a great deal of atrophy from being as long as I think he's had a hundred days I think since that he had been either in the hospital or in um, rehab and so pray for him uh, pray for the family pray for Bev but celebrate as well celebrate as well uh, do also pray for my friend Liz Holmes uh, she is back home uh, she has been home since just before Christmas but keep praying for her also remember our friends the Swifts uh, I know they had a rough time at Christmas not that they didn't people have been so good to them God has blessed them so richly and, and through other people uh, but as you understand and as you know many of you in a personal uh, for personal experience, having lost a loved, in this case her husband, uh, back just a couple months ago, and have facing that first Christmas, especially with young children, uh, young wife, uh, there's not much that we can do. We can be there, we can pray for them, but pray that God would do. And He is, and He will. But pray for the Swifts. Until next time, once again, I do love you. Uh, have a wonderful, wonderful new year. Uh, and I pray that God would help you to see all that you can be in 2022. We'll talk more about that another time. But look forward to a new page, a new day, a new year to live for Christ. Until next time, I love you. More importantly, God loves you. Keep your eyes on him.